Okay, so uh, in the last chapter, we learned about the three primary mechanisms by which heat naturally flows um, when left, left to its own devices, right? Heat can um, conduct through materials, heat can be convected by fluids, um, and heat can radiate um, from any object. Um, and the technology that powered the Industrial Revolution, and which a lot of our current technology is also based on, um, uses the idea that we can do more than just let heat naturally flow from one place to another. We can actively manipulate the transfer of heat. Right? Um, a steam engine could not only uh, you know, move heat from a hot place, the boiler, to a colder place, the outside, but it could actually do useful work in the process. It could pump fluids, it could move a train, uh, all these things. Similarly, um, you can move heat in the opposite direction to what it naturally wants to do. You can make heat go from a cold place to a hotter place. And now that I live in Atlanta, um, air conditioners and refrigerators are in fact now very important to me. So, you know, I think we've mentioned many times in this class that actually thermal energy is just another form of energy. And we know that energy can be converted from one form to another. But what are the actual rules here? What determines, you know, um, how heat can flow not only naturally, but also when we are either doing or receiving work? Um, and this subject, the rules governing the movement or the exchange of heat, is called thermodynamics, and it's actually one of my favorite branches of physics. So in this chapter, uh, we're going to meet the laws of thermodynamics, just like we met Newton's laws of motion back in chapter two or something. Um, and then, so that's what we'll do in this lecture, uh, recorded lecture, and then 9.2 and 9.3 will be using those laws in the context of trying to understand how engines work and how refrigerators work. Okay, so uh, section 9.1 of these lecture notes, um, which is kind of, um, doesn't have an exact correspondence with some of the material in Bloomfield's uh, book, but it kind of draws on a few different sources. So, you know, as I mentioned, without air conditioners to keep our homes or our apartments or our dorm rooms um, comfortable in these southern summers, um, we would be pretty uh, uncomfortably hot um, when we were inside, right? Heat from the outside, uh, the hot air from the outside would naturally flow into our rooms, and it wouldn't stop flowing into our rooms until the inside was just the same temperature as the outside. Disgusting, right? So as we'll see in uh, 9.3, air conditioners work by actively pumping heat out of your house, right? But you might ask, why is this type of active pumping of heat even necessary? You know, aren't there some other things that we could do to cool down our house? Um, so, you know, let me start out by kind of writing a few, um, you know, three schemes three schemes to cool down uh, without, without using uh, air conditioning. And what I want to do is kind of walk through each of these three ideas and then explain why they don't work in the context of the laws of thermodynamics, right? So scheme one would be, well, just let the heat flow. Let the heat flow, um, you know, from my house, from my house, to my neighbor's house. You know, sorry neighbor. You know, why not just say, okay, you know, there's a certain amount of thermal energy in my house. Energy is just like anything else. Why don't we just let it flow to a different place? And then there'll be less thermal energy where I am, I'll feel colder. So that's one um, that's one scheme. You know, another scheme would be, well, why don't we just destroy some of that thermal energy? Destroy thermal energy in my house in my house. Okay, that's scheme two. And scheme three um, is, well, why not convert some of the thermal energy in my house? Thermal energy in my house to some other useful form of, of energy, like maybe even electricity, you know, to something useful. e.g. electrical energy, right? This would feel like a total win. Not only would I cool the house down by getting rid of some of the thermal energy, um, I would use that thermal energy to power something, you know? And then I wouldn't have to pay the, uh, the power company as much money, right? So it turns out that the laws governing thermal energy rule out all three of these possibilities, um, but let's meet the laws of thermodynamics and learn why that's the case, okay? So historically, there are three laws of thermodynamics, um, and Sometime after the fact, people realized that it might be helpful uh, to actually th break things down a little bit farther and talk about the zeroth law, the zeroth law of thermodynamics. So in this section, there'll be laws zero, one, two, and three, th thermodynamics. Okay. Um, and 
the zeroth law of thermodynamics basically says temperature is transitive. Okay. Said another way, uh, said a little bit more verbosely, it says uh, there's such a thing as thermal equilibrium, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a moment. Um, it says uh, if object A is in thermal equilibrium, Uh, with some other object, object B, and um, if B is in thermal equilibrium with object C, then um, A and C are also in equilibrium. A and C are also in thermal equilibrium. Okay, so this is the problem with that original scheme. Why not just let some of the thermal energy in my house flow uh, to somewhere else? Um, the problem is as follows, you know, our house is in thermal equilibrium with the outside air. And what that means is that there's no, when two objects are in thermal equilibrium, there's no net transfer of heat um, between them. So for instance, if, you know, at first my house is a little bit colder than the outside and there's no air conditioning, then heat is trying to flow into my house until my house is in thermal equilibrium with the outside. So my house, object A, is in thermal equilibrium with the outside air, we'll call it object B. At the same time, our neighbor's house, object C, is also in thermal equilibrium with the outside air, object B. And that means my house is in thermal equilibrium with my neighbor's house. And so no heat will naturally flow back and forth between them. Okay. So, you know, what this means, you know, is that anything that's in thermal equilibrium with something else, there's some characteristic, there's some quantitative way that we can characterize its current state and say any object that has that same kind of current state will be in thermal equilibrium with it, right? And what we call the quantitative measure of thermal equilibrium is temperature. So the zeroth law of thermodynamics basically says that um, temperature is a way that we can measure whether two objects are in thermal equilibrium. Do they have the same temperature? And temperature is a transitive um, relationship. So if you know A has some temperature and B has the same temperature, then those things would be in thermal equilibrium. If you put them in contact, no heat would flow back and forth. And I just want to comment, you know, transitivity, this feels very obvious in some ways, right? There's lots of transitive relationships in the universe, you know? Um, but I just want to point out that there are also plenty of intransitive relationships in the universe, right? Um, and so, for instance, uh, I listed some of these in the lecture notes. You know, the game of rock, paper, scissors um, has a, you know, winning relationship, which is non-transitive. Rock beats uh, scissors, scissors beats paper, uh, but rock does not beat paper, right? Or similarly, the food uh, chain does not have a set of transitive relationships. You know, a waiting bird might eat a small fish, the small fish might eat like plankton or whatever, but the waiting bird does not eat plankton, right? Uh, and there's a bunch of other kind of listed non-transitive relationships in the lecture notes, okay? But what this means is that, you know, again, our first scheme won't work because our house can be characterized by some temperature and um, our neighbor's house, also in thermal equilibrium with the outside air, uh, will have the same temperature. And so heat won't just spontaneously flow from our house to their house. There's no way of just, you know, naturally letting it pipe in that direction. Okay, so that's the, that's the zeroth law. Temperature is a way of measuring thermal energy and temperature is transitive. All right, uh, the first law of thermodynamics, the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, I hope that you were kind of skeptical of this middle scheme in the first place where I just said destroy thermal energy, right? Because in this class, we're very used to thinking about the idea that thermal energy, well, it's another form of energy. Heat is a form of energy, energy is conserved, and you're not allowed to just destroy it. When people were first trying to understand the subject of heat and thermodynamics, it was not obvious that heat was just another form of energy. Remember in the last chapter, I think we talked about how Scientists used to think that heat was some kind of material fluid that repelled itself and that could flow from one object to another, right? But it's not. Heat is a type of energy, and so, you know, no luck with that scheme of just saying destroy thermal energy, 
So the first law of thermodynamics is a way of you know encoding this idea, and it just says basically that heat is a form of energy. Heat is a form of energy. That's kind of part one, um, and it says uh, uh, it says also also um, if you consider a stationary object, if you consider a stationary object so that we don't have to worry about the kinetic energy. Uh, but it's easy to see how this would be generalized if it was a non-stationary object, I hope. But anyway, if you consider a stationary object, then the change, the change in that object's um, internal energy, that object's internal energy, energy, um, is equal to equal to the heat added to the object, heat added to the object, uh, minus the work done by the object, done by the object on its environment, on its environment. OK. so. That is to say, if we take a stationary object and we heat it up, its internal energy increases. And that could be both, say, its internal kinetic energy, the thing that we measure temperature by. It could be, you know, maybe the chemical potential energy changes or some other form of internal energy. But in this section, we'll mostly be thinking about how the internal kinetic energy changes. But anyway. So if we heat up an object, its internal energy increases. And if we do work on an object, its internal energy increases. Right? So in symbols, what we'll often say is that the change in internal energy, so big delta for change in and u for internal energy, the change in internal energy of a stationary object is equal to uh, q, which is the heat, uh, minus the work done by the object. And I just want to point out that there's like a, a work done by object. My object. There's like an interesting sign convention here, um, which different books use differently. And the point is just to keep it straight in your head physically what's going on. Right? So if the object does work on the environment, as we'll talk about in a little bit, then that means it's using some of its internal energy to do that work. So you know, positive work by the object on the environment makes the object lose internal energy. And if we do work on the object, if we do positive work on the object, um, then that's like the object doing negative work uh, on the environment, and that increases the potential energy. Right? This should remind you a little bit of the discussion of you know when we are doing work to lift an object up, you know we do work on the object, and the object is doing work of the opposite sign back on us because it's applying a negative sign force through the same distance, for instance, as we lift it up. So the first law is really just making very explicit that heat is just another form of energy. And so we can move it around either by doing work uh, or letting heat flow. But just as we can't destroy energy, we can't just destroy heat because it's energy. It's a form of energy. All right, that's the first law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics, 9.1.3, the second law. This one is very important. So you know the third scheme that we listed up here doesn't sound quite as bad as the first two, right? At least at first glance. Okay, you know um, heat naturally flows from hotter to colder. If things are the same temperature, it's not just going to naturally spontaneously flow from your house at some temperature to your neighbor's house at the same temperature. That doesn't work. Heat's a type of energy, so you can't just just destroy it. But what's stopping us from just uh, changing the form of energy, converting all of the heat in my house to some other form of energy, which is nice and useful, right? This doesn't, at first glance, feel like it's as bad as the other two schemes. Okay. Unfortunately, things are not so easy. Um, thermal energy is encoded in you know, the kind of disorderly, erratic motion of atoms within a substance, right? The temperature of a gas is related to how fast those gas molecules are flying around, um, but they're all moving around in random directions so that the gas itself doesn't have any external kinetic energy, right? And converting that kind of disorderly kinetic energy into neat, ordered, useful forms of energy is really challenging. And importantly, it rarely happens spontaneously, right? So for instance, uh, when we knock over uh, a glass of wine, for instance, and the wine spills everywhere and the glass shatters, um, it's 
somehow been very easy to convert uh, all of this nice ordered system into just disorder everywhere, right? But why don't we ever see the shards of glass and the wine spontaneously go from the table where it fell, like back into an assembled wine glass? There's nothing in Newton's laws of motion that actually gives us the answer to that. If you have a video, say, of two objects colliding and then coming apart, and you run that video in reverse, and you know, these are just like billiard balls undergoing an elastic collision, um, it looks like the system forward and backwards, played forwards and backwards, is still just governed by Newton's laws, right? So what's really stopping uh, us from uh, going backwards in this sense, you know, uh, and having disordered collections of things spontaneously reassemble into ordered collections of things? It turns out that, you know, these kinds of reverse processes where random motion just, you know, by chance leads to a nice, beautiful, ordered outcome is in fact possible uh, in a mathematical sense. If you waited long enough, it really could happen that, you know, um, a glass that you dropped onto the floor and it shattered, if you waited long enough, it's technically possible that all of those shards of glass would spontaneously reassemble, you know? Or if you burnt a log uh, and you underwent all of these chemical reactions, it's possible in a mathematical sense that um, all of those chemical reactions would spontaneously run in reverse and you'd find yourself with the original log that you used to generate heat. But you would have to wait an unbelievably long amount of time before you would expect statistically to see that kind of reverse behavior. You know, you'd have to wait much, much, much longer than the age of the universe before you saw that kind of reverse process going on. You know, uh, one way that um, people like to talk about this is sometimes to think about, you know, um, if you have, you know, uh, a monkey, a monkey typing on a keyboard forever, typing on a keyboard forever. So I guess this is an immortal monkey. Uh, randomly hitting these keys, um, the monkey will eventually will eventually produce Hamlet, or you know any other work of Shakespeare. Right? And in a statistical sense, this is true. If you just randomly bash on your keyboard and generate you know, a very long string of random characters, if you can do that forever, then eventually in that string of characters, you will have randomly typed out you know, the complete works of Shakespeare or the text of Hamlet. Okay? But how unlikely is that? You know, if you say, you know, this, is, this is true-ish, you know, but how long do you have to wait? Do we have to wait? And we can estimate that, you know, Fermi estimation style, um, just by kind of saying something like, you know, in a keyboard, you know, Hamlet has, let's say, English characters, there's line numbers, there's capital letters, there's punctuations. Let's just say, you know, there are, there are, you know, about 50 characters, letters, numbers, etc. Right? So every time we randomly hit a button on our computer uh, or on the monkey's keyboard, there's like a 1 in 50 chance that we've hit the right letter. And to produce the correct text of Hamlet, we have to produce the right letter um, for as many times as there are characters in Hamlet in that entire play. Right? Um, so 1 50th of the time, uh, we hit the right letter. Hit the right button to get the next uh, character in Hamlet. Hamlet. How many characters are there in Hamlet? I have no particular idea, um, but, sorry, I'll use letters, um, but there are about, there are about, you know, 100,000 characters letters and numbers and space bars and stuff that we have to hit um, in the play, in the play. So the odds, <laughs> the odds of randomly typing correctly are, you know, the chance of randomly getting any character correct to the power of the number of characters in the entire play. Okay. And that's kind of like, you know, if you're flipping a coin, heads or tails, right? Um, the chance of 
calling the sequence correctly, if I say the outcome is going to be tails, tails, well, the first outcome is a 50-50 chance of being tails, and the second outcome is a 50-50 chance of being tails. So that's one half to the power of two. If I wanted to guess three tails in a row, the chances of that are a half times a half times a half, one half to the power of three. So similarly, this is something like 1 50th to the power of 100,000. Um, that is a very small number. 1 50th to the power of, let's say, 100,000. You know, amusingly, if you type this into Google uh, or most calculators, it's so small that it says zero just because it doesn't have enough digits of precision to tell you just how small the number this is. Um, to show you just how small the number this is. Um, one way we can uh, think about this, sorry. So 1 50th uh, to the power of 100. So what are the chances of even getting 100 characters in a row correct in Hamlet? You know, this is something like 1.2 times 10 to the minus 170, OK? So even if you're typing, you know, 100 characters per second, right? So even if you're typing 100 characters per second, you would have to wait. You would wait. Um, 1 divided by this number, 1.2 times, and if it's 100 characters per second, I'm going to write this as 1, uh, uh, 10 to the minus 168 seconds to get just 100 letters in a row. You know, how long is that? Um, 10 to the power of 168 seconds. Well, that's about 10 to the power of 160 years. Enormously longer than the age of the entire universe, um, just to get the first 100 characters of Hamlet, let alone all of them. So the idea here, circling back to the idea of the second law of thermodynamics, is that producing order from disorder is really hard. And the odds of happening of these kind of processes happening are so enormously small that, in fact, a safe word for these kind of fantastically, unimaginably unlikely events is to say that they are impossible. Right? So turning order into disorder, that's easy. But recovering order from a disordered state is essentially impossible. At least it's impossible if you're not going to do any work. Okay? So um, the best that we can do is to kind of say, the amount of disorder in an isolated system will never decrease spontaneously. Okay? And in physics, um, the way we characterize, the way we um, say quantify how disordered something is, is, um, is with entropy. Right? So entropy is kind of like a way of measuring how disordered a system is. And one statement of the second law of thermodynamics is that the entropy of a thermally isolated system never decreases. So if you have a thermally isolated system left to its own devices, it will never get spontaneously more organized, more ordered. The disorder will always increase. Right? Now, this caveat here, a thermally isolated system, that's important. If a system, like a set of objects or something, are allowed to exchange heat with another system, then there's no guarantees about what happens to the entropy if you just look at one of the two systems. Now combined, you know, you have object A and object B exchanging heat back and forth. Together, that can be a new system, thermally isolated from everything else. The entropy of that combined object will never decrease, but the entropy of one of the two parts of the system might change, might decrease. OK, so interestingly, this is one way of stating the second law of thermodynamics. Historically, um, the way the second law was said sounds very different. So the actual text of the second law is often things like, well, this is, uh, I'm going to give you two versions of it. Here's uh, Lord Kelvin's statement. Kelvin's statement is that no process is possible, is possible 
um, whose sole result, whose only result, is the complete conversion, complete conversion of heat to work. This is sometimes summarized as there are no ideal engines. Okay. Interesting. Um, there's another statement of the second law. This is uh, named after another scientist, Clausius, who actually came up with the word entropy. Um, and Clausius's statement is no process is possible, is possible, whose sole result, this is just how people talked back in the day, I suppose, um, is the transfer of heat from cold to hot. And this is sometimes summarized as saying there are no, there are no ideal fridges. There's no ideal refrigerators. Okay. Now, in this class, we're not going to dive into the details of why all of these different statements are actually equivalent to each other. You know, one of the kind of triumphs of 19th century science was to show that if you took any one of these statements, kind of the entropy version, the Kelvin version, the Clausius version, there were several others actually, you could show that that version from it, you could derive any of the other statements. And so all of these statements are actually equivalent to each other. In this class, we're not going to dive into the reasons why that's the case. Um, uh, but this second law of thermodynamics, the idea that the disorder of a thermally isolated system will never spontaneously decrease, is one of the deepest ideas in science. And um, I can't stress enough how kind of fundamental and important this is in understanding how the universe works. Um, in my lecture notes, I have some interesting quotes of 20th century scientists who are much more eloquent than I am, trying to express just how deeply embedded um, this idea is in, um, in modern science. OK, so what this law says is there's no way that we can perfectly turn heat into useful work. But it does allow us to turn some amount of heat into useful work, or move heat from a hotter place to a colder place while simultaneously doing some amount of work, as long as the total amount of entropy doesn't decrease. Right? Uh, on its own, heat flowing from a hot object to a cold object does in fact increase the total entropy, which is another way of talking about why heat flows naturally from hot to cold um, in the first place. So another way, uh, another strategy for cooling down the house, which I didn't list in this list because this is actually a not harebrained scheme, is to work within the constraints that the second law of thermodynamics provides. Right? So one thing that you could do is, for instance, your house is really hot. Maybe there's a cold like lake or pond or groundwater nearby. You could do work to pump that cool water into my house, into the house, let the water warm up as it absorbs some of the thermal energy in the house. So the thermal energy in the house will flow from the hot air and the hot you know, building itself into this cooler water. And then you can do more work to pump the water out of your house. In this way, you've done work and simultaneously moved some thermal energy out of your house. And then you dump the warmer water outside. This you know, doesn't violate any of these laws because what you're doing is not just you know, converting heat to work uh, or just moving uh, heat from cold to hot. You're involving a process that involves both heat transfer and work. Right? And this increases the total amount of energy uh, entropy if you consider not just your house, but a thermal system combined, composed of your house and the cold water and the world outside. And in that combined system, the total amount of entropy increases when you take cold water, heat it up a little bit, cool your house down a little bit, and dump the water outside. OK, before we leave uh, this section, I have to tell you about the third law of thermodynamics. But the third law of thermodynamics is kind of different in character from laws 0, 1, and 2. So the third law of thermodynamics The third law says that um, the entropy, the entropy of a system, approaches a constant value, approaches some particular value 
which doesn't depend on lots of things, some particular value, um, as the temperature approaches absolute zero. So I'll just write that as it approaches zero Kelvin. Okay. Um, so the third law is a little bit different in character from the other laws. And in fact, it's much more sensitive to the details of the theories that govern what happened at extremely low temperatures, like quantum mechanics. Right. So laws 0, 1, and 2 um, don't rely, for instance, on quantum mechanics being a correct statement about how the world works. But the third law is very sensitive to whatever the true low temperature theory is. Um, so I'm not going to dwell on it quite as much, but I'll just say that one important consequence, one important consequence of this third law of thermodynamics, and again, I won't talk about why the third law implies this particular consequence, is that um, it is impossible. It is impossible uh, to, well, say for any process, for any process, uh, to reduce the entropy, to reduce the entropy uh, of a system to its absolute value, absolute zero temperature value, absolute zero temperature value um, in a finite number of steps. OK, this is really important. What this is saying in kind of complicated language is that you know, at absolute zero temperature, um, the system will have some value of its entropy. And if you get a system to that value of entropy, you will have cooled the system to absolute zero. Okay? And what this is saying is that it is impossible, no matter what you do, to reduce the entropy of a system, to get your system down to absolute zero temperature in a finite number of steps. In other words, if you want to cool a system down, all the way to absolute zero temperature, you have to cool down infinitely slowly. Um, and we don't have time for that, right? You'll never get there. So in practical terms, you can get really close to absolute zero. And in fact, people have gotten just you know, cooled down systems to fractions of a degree, millionths of a degree above zero Kelvin. But if you want to get to actual zero Kelvin, you have to, do, you have to wait infinitely long, or you have to do an infinite number of steps in your cooling process, which is impossible. All right, so those are the three laws of thermodynamics. You know, law zero is a little bit obvious, but it kind of states the existence of temperature. Law one is a codification of the idea that heat is another form of energy and all that that entails. And the second law is this way of saying the disorder of a system is always increasing or the entropy of a system is never decreasing if you have a thermally isolated system and you're not doing any work to it. One of the things that I think is beautiful about this subject is in fact the way that, you know, scientists of the industrial age thinking about really kind of dirty stuff like how burning coal can help you move a train, you know, how do engines work? How can we refrigerate and keep food cold? Scientists thinking about those kind of grubby, earthy processes um, discovered science which has this kind of deep natural connection to disorder in general this very you know, broad way of thinking about how systems behave. So uh, in the next few sections, we're going to talk about what these laws of thermodynamics actually imply when it comes to how do engines work? How do we take you know, a system that moves heat around and uses that heat to do work? And how do refrigerators work? You know, how are we able to do work on a system in order to move heat against the direction that it naturally wants to go? So that's what we'll see in the next few recorded lectures.